It was supposed to save Leyland. A new diesel engine, modernized and turbocharged, ready to compete with the best in Europe. Instead, it did the opposite. The TL-12 was a ticking time bomb, built on an outdated architecture, rushed into service and plagued with failures from day one. Operators hated it, mechanics dreaded it, and by the time Leyland realized the damage, it was already too late. This isn't just a story about a bad engine, it's about the engine that helped kill a giant. Before the TL-12 made headlines for all the wrong reasons, there was the AV-760, a workhorse born in a different era. Developed by AEC in the late 1950s, the AV-760 was a big straightforward 11.6 litre inline 6 diesel. It powered buses, lorries and anything else Leyland could bolt into it. It was loud, heavy and far from refined, but it ran. Fleet operators trusted it, mechanics knew it inside out. In a post-war Britain rebuilding its roads and transport networks, that mattered more than finesse. When AEC was folded into Leyland in the 60s, the AV760 stuck around. And for a while, it worked. Through the 70s, it kept fleets moving, but the world was changing fast. Rising fuel prices, growing emission standards, and fierce competition from continental manufacturers meant that rugged simplicity wasn't enough anymore. Instead of investing in a clean sheet design, Leyland doubled down on the familiar. They took the old AV760 and tried to make it fit the new world. Added turbocharging, revised injection, cleaner emissions targets, the plan was to modernize without starting over. That decision would prove catastrophic. What emerged from this retrofit was the TL12, an engine born not from innovation, but from compromise. And while the AV760 had earned its place in history through reliability, the TL12 would soon earn its reputation for the exact opposite because what worked in the 1960s wouldn't survive the 1980s. Before we dive deeper into the disaster that followed, hit that subscribe button. Now, by the time the TL-12 officially launched in 1978, Leyland was desperate for a win. The commercial vehicle sector was heating up, and foreign competitors were taking chunks out of the British market with quieter, cleaner, and more reliable engines. Leyland needed to respond fast, so they unveiled the TL-12. On the surface, it looked like a modern engine. It still used the 11.6 litre inline six layout but came turbocharged with a new cylinder head, revised fuel injection, and a cleaner exhaust profile. Power was bumped up to around 240 horsepower and brochures boasted improved fuel economy, better torque, and smoother operation. It sounded like the right move, except it wasn't. Because beneath the cosmetic upgrades, the TL12 was just a dressed up AV760. Leyland hadn't redesigned the block or the crankcase. They'd taken a naturally aspirated engine built for a different era and forced it to meet new standards it was never designed for. The result was predictable. Higher internal stresses, cooling inefficiencies, and an engine that was permanently operating at the edge of its mechanical limits. Even more concerning, Leyland didn't have the luxury of testing it thoroughly over the years in the field. Pressure from upper management meant the TL-12 had to roll out fast. Ready or not. And it wasn't. The engine went into the marathon and later the T-45 road train. Some were even dropped into buses and coaches, despite early signs that the TL-12 didn't handle urban duty cycles well. Operators were told this was Leyland's future. But what looked promising on spec sheets would soon prove disastrous in practice, because once these engines hit the road, reality hit back, and it wasn't forgiving. The real test was coming next, day-to-day -day reliability, and the TL-12 was about to buckle under pressure. From the moment TL-12 equipped vehicles entered service, the complaints started rolling in. At first it was little things, sluggish throttle response, uneven idling, longer warm-up times. But then came the serious problems, overheating on long hauls, repeated head gasket failures, cracked cylinder heads and premature bearing wear. For fleet managers, this wasn't just frustrating, it was expensive. Vehicles were sidelined for days, sometimes weeks waiting on parts. Mechanics began to dread seeing a TL-12 come into the shop. One of the biggest culprits was thermal management. The AV-760 block had never been designed for turbocharging. The added boost pushed temperatures beyond safe thresholds, especially under full load. The cooling system, barely upgraded, struggled to keep up. Overheated engines became common, and when they did overheat, damage was often catastrophic. Warped heads, seized pistons, or coolant infiltration into the oil. The turbocharger itself was no hero either. Mounted high on the engine, it suffered from heat soak and oil starvation during shutdown. Failures were frequent and expensive. 
Leyland tried tweaks, upgrades, and patches, but none addressed the fundamental issue. The TL-12 was an old engine forced into a new world it didn't belong in. Worse still, manufacturing quality had dropped. Casting flaws, inconsistent assembly, and poor quality control meant that even when the TL-12 was built right, it still had a short fuse. And with Leyland already fighting reliability rumors, the TL-12 only made things worse. By the early 80s, fleet buyers were turning away. Some specified Cummins engines instead. Others jumped ship entirely, opting for Scania or Volvo. Leyland had hoped the TL-12 would be their comeback. Instead, it became their liability. And the damage wasn't limited to trucks. In public transport, things were unraveling too. The TL-12 wasn't just a truck problem. It was infecting Leyland buses next. Leyland's commercial truck division wasn't the only one relying on the TL-12. In a cost-cutting move that would backfire spectacularly, Leyland began fitting the engine into its passenger transport range, most notably the Leyland Tiger, a coach and bus chassis aimed at both urban and long-distance operators. On the surface, it made sense. Using a single engine across multiple platforms was efficient, simplified logistics, and reduced training requirements for mechanics. But there was one major problem. The TL-12 was never suited to the stop-start stress of city driving or the sustained load of intercity routes. It was a heavy haul engine being forced into delicate, high-frequency duty cycles. As in the freight world, the same pattern emerged. Overheating, blown gaskets, turbo failures, drivers reported sluggish acceleration, erratic performance, and engines that just didn't sound healthy. For coach operators trying to meet tight schedules and maintain service quality, this was a disaster. Many had previously relied on Gardner or Leyland 0.680 engines, both known for longevity and predictability. The TL-12 was neither. Even worse, breakdowns on passenger vehicles didn't just cost money, they damaged reputations. Stranded commuters and delayed school runs turned engine failures into a public issue. Municipal contracts were lost. Private coach firms began respecifying new orders with Volvo or Mercedes-Benz engines, eager to escape the shadow of Leyland's unreliability. In short, the TL-12's failure wasn't just confined to depots or service bays, it spilled out onto Britain's roads, cities, and headlines. And as the complaints piled up, even Leyland's internal teams began questioning the engine's future. But by this point, the problem wasn't just mechanical, it was systemic. Because the TL-12 didn't fail in a vacuum, it was the product of deeper issues festering inside Leyland itself. And that's where we turn next. By the early 1980s, it was clear that the TL-12 wasn't going to save Leyland. But here's the truth. It never stood a chance. Not because of bad luck, but because of the chaos behind the scenes. Leyland wasn't just a struggling manufacturer. It was a political football, a patchwork of merged companies, clashing egos and conflicting priorities. By the time the TL-12 was in development, British Leyland had absorbed AEC, Albion and Scammell, each with its own engineering legacy and internal culture. The result? Paralyzed decision-making and projects designed by committee. The TL-12 was built under constant compromise. Engineers wanted a clean sheet design. Finance refused to fund it. Managers demanded performance figures that looked good on paper. Government pressures prioritized job retention over product quality. In the middle of all of that, the TL-12 was rushed out of the door, cobbled together from legacy parts and given a marketing spin it couldn't live up to. Leyland's factory floors weren't helping either. Quality control had become an afterthought. Engines were leaving the line with misaligned components. Loose tolerances or cooling systems barely pressure tested. And if an engine failed in service, operators were left to fight over inconsistent support and long wait times for spares. Internal memos show the cracks. Warnings ignored. Field failures mounting and silence from upper management. There was no unified plan. No one wanted to own the problem. And without accountability, the TL-12 disaster spiraled out of control. The engine wasn't just a mechanical flaw, it was the symptom of a deeper illness inside Leyland, a company trying to modernize on a 1950s budget while pretending to compete with global giants. And as the company scrambled to contain the fallout, a quiet shift began, one that would seal the TL-12's fate and mark the beginning of the end. By 1982, even Leyland couldn't ignore the obvious. The TL-12 had failed. Warranty claims were piling up, Operators were losing patience, and competitors were capitalizing hard. Scania and Volvo were now seen as the gold standard, while Leyland was a punchline in trucking circles. It was clear, the TL-12 was more liability than asset, so Leyland began quietly phasing it out. The company turned to Cummins, importing their L10 diesel, 
a 10-litre six-cylinder engine that was lighter, more efficient, and crucially, reliable. It wasn't a British engine, but by this point, Pride had taken a back seat to survival. Fleet buyers welcomed the change. Suddenly, Leyland's trucks were usable again. The transition was telling. TL-12 engines were quietly pulled from production lines. In the bus division, some platforms were reworked for Gardner or Rolls-Royce Eagle engines. Others shifted to foreign engines. The TL-12 became something few dared to request and fewer dared to maintain. But the cost of that failure didn't vanish. Leyland had burned bridges. The TL-12 debacle had cost them contracts, credibility, and cash. Worse, it had shattered trust with operators who had once been fiercely loyal. A brand that used to be shorthand for British trucking excellence now had an asterisk next to every product it made. Even when Leyland's later offerings improved, the damage lingered. Buyers remembered. Mechanics warned each other. The reputation lost couldn't be undone by simply changing engines. The TL-12 didn't take Leyland down by itself, but it did accelerate the collapse. It became the symbol of a company that couldn't get out of its own way, a tragic chapter in an already messy story. And by the time Leyland's commercial division began to recover, the TL-12 had already written its name in the history books for all the wrong reasons. Today, the TL-12 is mostly forgotten outside of enthusiast circles and scrapyards. You won't find many still running today, and those that are, well, they've likely been rebuilt more times than anyone wants to admit. But its legacy lingers, not for what it achieved, but for what it represents. The TL-12 is a textbook case in what happens when compromise replaces vision. It was supposed to modernize a legacy, but instead exposed just how far behind Leyland had fallen. Every failure on the road was a reminder that the company was cutting corners, reacting instead of leading, and gambling with its future. For operators, it became a cautionary tale. For competitors, it was proof that British Leyland had lost the plot. And for Leyland's own engineers, many of whom knew this engine was a ticking time bomb, it was a bitter lesson in what happens when management ignores reality. After the TL-12, Leyland's decline only sped up. Mergers, bailouts, and foreign takeovers followed. By the late 80s, the name was all that remained. The trucks improved, but Leyland, as a self-reliant British powerhouse, was finished. In hindsight, the TL-12 wasn't just a mechanical failure, it was a turning point. The moment when the industry stopped seeing Leyland as a leader and started seeing it as a relic. It's easy to dismiss this as just another bad engine, but when you dig deeper, the TL-12 tells a bigger story. A story of missed chances, ignored warnings, and the high cost of clinging on to the past. And that's why the TL-12 wasn't just an engine that failed, it was the engine that helped bury a titan. The TL-12 is more than a cautionary footnote in diesel history. It's a reminder that engineering without vision leads nowhere, that legacy alone doesn't guarantee survival, and that when a company stops listening to its engineers, to its customers, and to its failures, it digs its own grave. Leyland's story didn't end with the TL-12, but that engine marked the beginning of the end. If you've worked on one of these, driven one, or suffered through one, we want to hear from you. Drop your stories in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive, give it a like, subscribe for more hidden histories of engines that change the world, good or bad, and ring the bell so you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.